Hello, deep learners. I'm Andrew Ng, founder of DeepLearning.ai, and I'm excited to welcome you to our global deep learning community. I know that many of you are here today because you want to break into AI and build your career. I hope that being part of this community will help you to do so. To give you a proper welcome, I'd like to show you around the DeepLearning.ai offices and meet some of the teams so that you can see where it all happens. Oh, hi, Andrew. Um, do you want to tell our friends at Pine AI what you do at Deep Learning AI? Sure. Hi, everyone. I, I make articles and other media that help people learn about AI and help them understand the huge impact that AI is having in the world. Today, I'm putting together the next issue of The Batch, our weekly newsletter, and I'm looking for the biggest stories of the week to keep our readers informed. What's been the most surprising thing you've run into working on The Batch? How much is going on in this field? There is never a dull moment. Uh, you know, you might think from the outside that machine learning engineers really understand everything about AI, but nobody understands everything about AI because this field is just coming to life right before my eyes as I put this thing together every week. All right, I know you're really busy, so I'll let you get back to it. Thanks. See you later. Let's go meet Kian, who helped me create the deep learning specialization. He's working on an exciting new project. Hey, Kian. So, do you want to tell the people at Pine AI what you're working on? Yes, sure. Um, I'm leading a project called Workera, uh, focusing on helping. Uh, people get offers uh, in AI and navigating their career by uh, testing their skills, uh, preparing for interviews and certifying them, as well as uh, matching and referring them to good jobs in AI. That's really cool. And what's the most exciting part of your day? You know, the AI field is new. Uh, organizations and jobs are still misunderstood. So I'm excited to help people understand what different types of jobs exist in the field, uh, what tasks they will work on, and what skills are needed to achieve those tasks. And that's really important work. Well, it's nice chatting. And now let's go chat to Motel, who is on their product team. Hey, Andrew. Do you want to say hi? to our friends at Pine AI and let them know what you're working on. I would love to. Hi, everyone. I lead the product team in deeplearning.ai, where we create AI education content accessible to people all around the world, people like you. And what are you most excited about right now? I am so excited to see our community grow and to see how eager people are to learn more about AI. Thanks, also. Thanks, Andrew. So, as you can see, our team is working hard to support you and help you learn. It's never been easier than before to break into AI. So, if you want to build a career, you can leverage online resources available, including open source code, datasets, papers, and online courses like a deep learning specialization on Coursera. As part of this journey, I hope you get your hands dirty too. Don't be afraid of diving in to build your own project or go ahead and try to replicate a research paper that you're excited about. One thing that I've seen help a lot of people succeed is if you can build a community or find a community of fellow deep learners you can meet with and study with on a regular basis. In fact, I hope that this Pine AI meetup that you're at right now will be a good place for you to meet these people. I hope you enjoyed the event today and that you learn a lot, both from the talks and from each other. And once again, welcome to the deeplearning.ai community. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, everyone, wherever you are in the world. I uh, hope everyone got used to springing forward, at least in the places that are still doing that, uh, like most of the United States where I live. Um, we're excited tonight uh, to have a live viewing of Pandemic, uh, which is a project that I would have the honor to work with. We have a special guest that we will be introducing following the movie. Uh, we'll be meeting the director of the research, uh, we'll also be uh, meeting the producer and we'll be able to discuss not just what it was like to be on the project, 
uh, from a logistical perspective, but also what it's like to be working on producing these types of films and bringing science uh, to popular culture. Uh, it's a very interesting field to be in. It's really amazing to have been a part of the project from, from start to finish on this. And I'm excited that we have uh, our guests with us tonight. But before we get uh, to them, of course, have to bring in uh, my partner in crime, Fritz Peraza. Fritz, how are you today, sir? I'm doing I'm doing good. Um, I'm excited to to hear what people have to say and any questions I'll have about the show. So I'm really excited. Awesome. Now, Fritz, did you watch the movie before this, or is this gonna be the first time you see the movie? Yeah, I watched it actually earlier today. So I've got I've got some questions written down. Um, but I'm I'm excited. That's awesome. Well, I'm excited as well. Uh, well, let's go ahead and without further ado, let's start the movie, shall we? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there we are. Uh, we are having some technical difficulties with actually showing the film. So with <laughs> instead of showing the film while our technical folk bring that up, um, no, it's okay. Uh, why don't we? You, why don't we just bring up our guest and we can just start the conversation, shall we, Fritz? Why don't you make the introductions? Yeah, sure thing. I will. I'll introduce uh, both of y'all before we we get into it. Um, I'll start with Dr. Basim. Um, he is a computational biologist who specializes in integrating emerging technologies in medicine, research, and policy. He received his bachelor's degree in biology and bioinformatics from Virginia Commonwealth University, and then went on to receive his PhD in immunology at Eastern Virginia Medical School. He is a current public policy for the uh, American Association of Immunologists and an MD candidate at Eastern Virginia Medical School. He serves on several biomedical and health technology boards and is well respected on the global stage with over a hundred peer reviewed publications, articles, presentations, and lectures. His unique blend of expertise in biomedical research, medicine, big data, and policy has made him a highly sought after consultant and keynote speaker for many groups, including the WHO, 
United Nations and the White House Office of Science and Techno Technology Policy. Um, I'll do Mary next. Mary Rectoris is a producer for Relativity's in-house creative team. She produces On the Merits, a docuseries providing a true look at important world events, the people at the center of the event, and explores how they use data and open a path towards justice. She also co-hosts and produces the Stellar Woman podcast, which celebrates female leaders in tech and shares their stories and practical tips to inspire emerging leaders, build a supportive community of allies, and promote gender equity and empowerment. Hi, welcome. Hey Hello, thanks for having me and us. Absolutely. Sorry we had the technical issues. We'll see if we can get those fixed. What we'll do is we'll share the link on the YouTube live and then people can watch the movie and at least uh, follow it from there. Um, mm -hmm. But first question uh, to you, Mary, how, I know this is what, uh, this is kind of what your passion is about. I know you're about impact. Working on these types of projects, being able to communicate science in, in a way that's palatable to the, to the lay community. I, what, how do you go about doing that? How do you uh, try to, because this is a complex subject, right? Artificial yeah. intelligence, but science, depending on what technology you're doing can be very complex. How do you even start, how does the creative process even begin to be able to start telling this kind of a story? Well, I am a marketer, so I'm not super embedded in the medical space, nor the tech, I know the basics. So the first question I think is, do I understand this baseline? So artificial intelligence, do I have a general understanding? And then think about the audience. So Taya, when we interviewed you for the documentary, there were some you know, baseline questions like what is artificial intelligence? And perhaps we use that in the doc or that could just be context building. And then as you set that baseline throughout, you can get more into the nitty gritty and then the audience will start to pick up some of the nuances of the science as well. So kind of think through if you're describing it to a friend or your parent, Will they understand it? And then I think that makes for a film that will resonate with those who are newer to the field or might be more embedded in the space. Tayab, when you found out that they were gonna be working on this and turning into uh, a documentary, what was your perspective of how, what you thought about that and, and being a part of that process? Uh, I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, I think it's always great when you can take the work that you're doing, distill it down so that others can not only get involved with it, but also see where the impacts are. Um, I think, you know, me, me, me and you both, Jose, have um, done a couple different uh, talks about this project in its various stages. And it's always fun to hear from people that have other perspectives and say, oh, okay, have you guys thought about using this for X? Have you thought about using it for Y? Um, why aren't you bringing in these folks over here? So I think it's always nice to have a, a wide variety of people being able to be exposed to the project. Mary, when uh, when you started work, how did you do from a logistical perspective? How was it, especially during a pandemic? I mean, I mean no pun intended, but uh, yeah. how did you manage to like wrangle all the cats? And then Tayeb, I'll ask you the same question from uh, from a from a real world like AI perspective, but Mary, from a creative perspective, how how was that? Tell us about that process. It has been a challenge for our team, an interesting challenge, just because the work we do is in-person filming. In our first documentary that we produced for On the Merits, um, we talked about the Flint water crisis, and we all went to Flint and met the people and filmed in person. You can develop that rapport and get a sense for the area. This was difficult because we were doing a lot of it via Zoom, and we're, how do you get the quality compared to an in-person filming. And we did some with some of our relativians and we had to adhere to certain protocols. And it was one of the few nice months we have here in Chicago. So we had the luxury of being outside. And we kind of were like, let's not over engineer this. This is a film about the pandemic. So let's show people in their natural environments. And I think the juxtaposition between the in-person filming and the Zoom played very nicely for this narrative. So we did a little bit of what we could. I think we sent some GoPros out. I'm not sure if we sent them to you both for the film. So correct me if I'm wrong. All right. Uh, I think my. I didn't get a GoPro. All right. Well, I think my creative director <laughs> is on here. Trying, uh. <laughs> we'll be sure to ship one out. But uh, I think that was pretty much the bare minimum we did. And we're like, 
you know, we'll work with you for 15 minutes. Let's fix your lighting. Dr. Maria, you had a nice lamp or a nice light already. So you had some of the equipment, but it was basically, let's really show what the reality of this is. And I think it really works for this. And we're learning as we go. We're still living in a world where a lot of the work we do is via Zoom. So I think it also shows just people in their home environments, which was interesting as well. Yeah, I needed someone to powder my head, unfortunately, but I didn't know. <laughs> you guys catch the movie later, you'll see, you'll see the glaring light off, off of it. Um, Tam, how was it for you, man? Like having to work with people, tell us a little bit uh, about the folks that were a part of it from a, from a, from an actual AI perspective and segmentation perspective and work perspective. Um, and then how was it like orchestrating that, organizing that? Uh, what, what were some of the obstacles that you faced and some of the things that you had to do to kind of overcome those? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think I got to just start by saying that Kaggle is an amazing platform that already makes it very easy for data scientists to be able to collaborate. So I think having the infrastructure there ahead of time made things easy from data science side. Um, the medical research side is a little bit harder. Um, unfortunately, they're not always the first to embrace new technology. Um, so getting them onto new platforms is uh, a little bit difficult. And then really being able to recruit the types of researchers, medical students, residents that you needed to get this pro project up and running. Um, we had uh, Dr. Michael Wells, who created the National Scientist Volunteer Database. Um, he let us use that database to be able to recruit a lot of not only the senior leadership that ended up being on the team, but a lot of the um, postdocs and graduate students and medical students that, that moved the project forward. Um, you had other organizations like Corona Y who were also participating on Kaggle for the data scientist part. And then you just had, I think, we had a couple pieces come out in Nature, Science, um, the New England Journal of Medicine. And as folks started reading some of those studies that were coming out, they started getting excited about this and how it could potentially impact some of the research they're doing in the future. And they started reaching out to me. So um, it was just a matter of trying to coordinate everyone. And um, really it was the leadership team. So um, Michael, who is a postdoc out of Yale, um, Lucas is a PhD student out of Harvard. Jan is a medical student in Germany. Um, Paul Moody and Anthony from Kaggle um, really pushed it all forward. I was just trying to orchestrate, really. Mary, who uh, who was made up the team that kind of did this? Like, obviously, you can find it all in the credits, but, yeah. but who's the core team that kind of really made this a reality? Definitely. So we have our executive producer, JC, JC Steinbrenner. And uh, on the merits was really, he brought this idea to life and very passionate about it. And then we have our director of photography, Josh McCausland. You can tell he is just, he's so talented. And uh, as well as Nicholas. Nicholas, I'm sorry if you're on here and I butcher your name. <laughs> Matejic, you know, you can say it a bunch of different ways, but Nicholas was also, he is the manager of our multimedia team. He really rallied everyone together and made sure we were on point. Winona Lozoda, as you saw in this film, that's unlike some of our other on the Merit documentary, a lot of it was supplemented, or you will see rather, by animation. And that really told the story. And I really elevated the way that we do this series. And I think beyond the pandemic, pun intended, we'll continue to add her in the mix because she's so talented. And then, of course, like our social team, Steve Tanner was great. We had different folks on our PR team. It was really a whole marketing effort, but the core team, the production team is who I just mentioned in there. All stars, we couldn't have done it without all of them. Awesome. Fritz, uh, questions from you, sir. Yeah, um, Mary, I would love to ask um, uh, kind of the the beginnings of it, like the early workings of the project. Like how how is that process for you? And and like who thought of the idea? Who do you have to talk to? What's What's that whole process like? For sure. So I heard about what this team of Relativians were doing. It was Rebecca Burry, who's our data scientist, and Trish Gleekson, our project manager. And then Alex Wilcoxon, who's not in the film, he's our engineer. And he got so in the nitty gritty that it didn't make it in the film, but he was a key person as well. I read about it in an email thread that someone forwarded like, hey, this is cool. And thank God I really read through all the inbox going in. I'm like, wow, this is I can't believe that our platform and our tech is being used to do something with such a real world impact. 
So you'd start doing some digging, trying to figure out what the story is, and also then sussing out with the team that, you know, I think this is a fit for on the merits. What do you all think? And I think we had a really good understanding of how technology was used to solve this like massive data issue, which is the core of what we're trying to do with the series. And you'll see in this film a little bit less, but our film before, we don't want it to be a relativity sales pitch. We want to show the people that are doing this awesome work. So then we start figuring out, okay, we know the relativians who were involved, who are some of the other key players? So we chatted with the semantics scholar who's part of the Allen Institute for AI. And they were the ones that were working to get the data on Kaggle, which was the platform that hosted this challenge. And they kind of were like, you always need that go-to person to really be the liaison or like rally people together to know who we should talk to. So that's how we got in talk, contact with Tayab. And then he was kind enough to introduce us to Dr. Murray. And then I also realized as we were doing interviews, you kind of uncover the many players in the mix. So saw that there was a huge global presence as well. Relativity was just a small piece of this large puzzle. And I was like, it'd be really cool to speak to some people globally. So what I did was I went on the Kaggle challenge and just looked at different contributors and saw that some were upticked or liked or commented on. And I'm like, this is, could be a long shot, but I messaged two gentlemen on LinkedIn, Gabriel Pereira and Jose Ripoles and said, I saw your work on Kaggle. I'm doing this documentary. Would you be open to a conversation? Both got back to me within 24 hours. I was shocked and we're like super pumped to do the recording. We did it later that week via Zoom. And that was just really cool as well because I didn't realize the massive scales of this project. I'm sure Tayab, you're very well acquainted with it because you're working across all these time zones, but that was really cool for me. And the last point I'll add is something that you find a lot with storytelling and filmmaking is you kind of find the angle or the really interesting pitch almost throughout your interviews. So we had an idea of what the data challenge was and what relativity did. What I didn't know was about like the bias in healthcare and how AI can help alleviate that in the long term. I'm passionate about healthcare. I'm a type one diabetic and I just, that's always been of interest to me. So this was an angle that I think we hit on near the end of the documentary but it's the angle that is most compelling to me. So that was really cool to learn as well. Long-winded answer for you, Fritz. No, that was awesome. Thank you. That's, yeah. that's really cool. I appreciate that. Yeah, of course. Fritz, anything else? Yeah, of course. I'm, I'm filled with questions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this one's kind of for, for both of you guys. What do you want to be kind of the takeaway after watching this film for, for the audience and, and for anyone who would watch this? What do you want to be like the main point that, that they come, come away with? I can so go to either of you guys. You guys can Yeah, mine kind of dovetails from what I just spoke about. So I was chatting with the team and the director of photography, Josh, like he's very passionate about on the merits about raising awareness for like marginalized communities. And I think what this story really brought to light was the impact of the pandemic had on marginalized communities. You see it in the numbers. And so we wanted to just raise awareness about this. And we, I think we referred to the CDC's website that gives resources and ways to get back to your community. So I think that would be just our biggest takeaway was educate yourself and whatever you feel comfortable or what you're able, like get involved, whether it's just learning, whether it's contributing or getting involved, that would be my my main call to action. Yeah, Tab. I'm, I'm definitely gonna echo Mary on the point of being able to get involved. I think this project showed that everyone has some sort of talent or ability that they can contribute in you know, in the midst of a global pandemic or really in the midst of any complex problem. Like you have a skill set, you have knowledge um, about a certain area. Uh, we were able to leverage medical students, graduate students, attendings, postdocs, folks that normally don't really get involved in research or data science and say, hey, we can find a way to get you involved. So I think part of it is, is knowing that you can find a way to get involved. And then the second big one is you know, we were able to do this for COVID-19. Why can't we do it for other diseases or other global complex problems? And the Allen Institute for AI, we actually just published a piece last week on this. Um, even till, I guess, last week ago, there's around half a million papers in the core 19 data set. Only 
35%, 40% of them still have full text available. So, you know, I think there needs to be a call for open science so that we can actually leverage other communities, whether it's data scientists, economists, um, social scientists, to be able to get involved with research. Thank you. That That is awesome. Um, just one more question. Um, do you guys have like a favorite moment or line or something that came from, from this process or that ended up in the film um, that you want to share? My favorite part that I really fought for was the what is data science and kind of you kick that off and then people are like, what is data science? And then Rebecca comes in and just was like, it's these three things to me. So I just thought that was, it was a bit of humor and levity in like a very yeah. serious film. So I really liked that part of the film. Yeah, that one was a little embarrassing for me. You, you hate <laughs> it was at your expense. So I on it. Um, <laughs> I, I feel like I've, I've started taking on taglines. Um, and Dr. Mori's great with this as well. Um, he always comes up with really impactful statements that'll, that'll stick with you. Um, I think a couple of them are, you know, breaking down data silos. Uh, we, we, we start hearing that one left and right. And one I've started using a lot more is I'd rather be approximately right than precisely wrong. Um, and then fortunately, a lot of research and science sometimes doesn't necessarily go by that motto. And in the midst of trying to make something perfect, you lose out on, uh, on, on things that can be very beneficial for the general community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That's that's my questions for now. <laughs> thank you, Fritz. Uh, we have been told by the technical team that we may have fixed the initial problem, so we are going to attempt to show the actual film. If not, we have questions from the audience and we'll keep the conversation going. But let's try to take a pause intermission and actually watch the film hopefully we fix the tech problems but if not we'll come back and we'll keep uh we'll keep engaging with everyone Well, apparently we didn't fix the technical problems. That's <laughs> the uh, anticipation. Just I know it's it, like it, a it, we planned it. Uh, we have a couple of questions for the audience. Fritz, why don't you start gearing up which ones you want to pull up? Um, mm -hmm. While I keep asking, uh, talking with Mary and you know, I'm a very strong uh, proponent of uh, bridging the gap between science and science education and bringing it to the forefront. I think it's that's something that we try to do it at Astro Media, and that's why it was kind of developed. I mean, this whole concept that science as a whole uh, in popular culture doesn't have the voice that a lot of other things do and doesn't really even have the sway that science had, you know, maybe 50, 60 years ago or however, whenever you want to go back. How... It, how important do you think is the collaboration of, of these kinds of things, of science, technology, and the arts, in trying to get the message out, uh, not just of what science is doing, but also of the limitations that science has? What are your guys' perspectives of how this is in general, and, and what are some other potential important stories that you think need to be told? Mary, you can start, and then tell you that after her, please. Taya, why don't you kick us off? Because I think you're super well versed in this, so I'll probably just take it back <laughs> off you. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I I believe you know bringing bringing science science to the masses is critical. Um, last 
we um, we were on Capitol Hill with the American Association of Immunologists. And I think for the first time, no one had to start the meeting with what an immunologist act actually is. Um, I think it's the first time you're seeing scientists um, on popular media. You know, people know the names of immunologists. You know, before the pandemic, no one would have known who the head of the NIH is or who Dr. Fauci is um, outside of our community. But you start realizing the impact that not only just basic science research or medical research or, or any other type has on your daily life. Um, and then I think it's going to encourage the next generation to want to get involved. When you start having scientists showing breakthroughs on national TV, um, it adds a little bit more, I think, uh, glamour to it, you know, than, than what you usually envision of a physician or a scientist just sitting behind a bench by themselves. Yeah, something I'm not sure if we dove too much into the film, but I think is a compelling angle that you both discussed is the evolving role of the physician and how I think it's a great line in the film that you all will eventually get to see is um, when you ask a kid, like, what is the typical tool a doctor uses? And it's a stethoscope. In the future, that'll be AI. And Tayeb, you talked about this when we interviewed you, that physicians are going to have to look at patients more holistically. It's not just let me be a di diagnose your problem and then you kind of move on. You have to look at the whole patient, you have important conversations with them about, okay, here's a treatment option. I think Dr. Marie, you talked about this. Maybe they don't have a car to get to that treatment option. You need to think about the care from point A to point B and get the people in the mix. And I'm fortunate enough to have an endocrinologist who's Dr. Lopes Phillipson. I'm sure he's not on here, but shout out to him. He's amazing. And he is so embedded in the technology. And sometimes you're waiting for an appointment and you're like running a little behind, but it's because he spends so much time and cares so much about his patients and wants to get them to know the latest technology. And I was a little bit slower to adopt technology to manage my diabetes. I was like, eh, just a naysayer. But because he was so excited about it and passionate and talked to me about it and talked to me about my concerns and let me know it would be a benefit to my lifestyle, not an impediment. Now I find my numbers are better. I feel like I can be more open with him. And I think physicians and the intersection between science and technology will lead to more human interactions and have better relationships that will lead to overall better health care. I'm not a doctor. That's just my opinion of what I learned from you both, but I think that'll be exceedingly important. No, but I think, I mean, that's that's the thing. I think having a conversation is always the most important thing, right? And mm -hmm. and that's the thing to me that I think is amazing about innovation, bringing people, and Taya mentioned this a little bit earlier, bringing people from different perspectives. And you're, Mary, I don't know if you would consider yourself, and I apologize if I overstepped, but you're a creative um, if you would n name yourself that, but having the combinations of artists with scientists, mm -hmm. with people that have just different, that's, that's why diversity is so important. It's not, it's diversity, in ethnicity, diversity in background, diversity in identity, bringing diverse voices to anything just brings up innovation and just brings up different perspectives that makes the world a better place that makes solutions to problems better. Uh, and that's why your voice is just as important in science or even more so than any of our voices uh, that are actively working on the scientific perspective. And, and it takes a village, right, to be able to build these things. And that's why thank you for what you do and thank you for what you've been doing with this. And thank you for telling this story. We have a ton of questions from the audience. So Fritz, why don't you start pulling uh, some of those for us, sir? Yes. Um, first one is Richards. Um, what was it like filming? Kind of what was the behind the scenes process? How, how was all that? So it was, it's interesting because it, it seems like you're going into a Zoom meeting because we sent like a Zoom link and you're like, OK, so we're going to reserve some time for setup. And we had information gathering calls with like Tayab, Dr. Murray, I think we had an information gathering call with you. And it's all about building that rapport because you don't want it to be like the first time you're meeting and saying, Fritz, what was your role in this project? And it's a more just like formulaic answer. You want to have some sort of relationship with them, get to know them and make your subjects feel relaxed. Because even in a Zoom setting, people get nervous. I get nervous. So I think when you let people know, like, this is what we're doing with the project. Like, here's our passion. Here's what we think your role could be and get them like confident and comfortable. I think those prep calls and getting to know people is imp even more imperative now in the Zoom world than before when it was all in person. I also think it was interesting. You just have to go with the flow. 
there will be audio issues. People's internets might go out, things that might cause you to, you know, panic a little bit or just stress out. You gotta just, you know, remain calm, cool, and collected. And something else I learned in filming in Zoom is being like very present still in the when you're listening to the interview subject speak. It's a little bit easier in person. You have the eye contact, you just have that physical proximity. But I find when interviewing, not to focus so much on my questions, but what people are saying, because then you can respond to them and you'll get those hidden stories like I mentioned to you earlier that you didn't even know existed. So it takes almost more work, I believe, to film via Zoom than in person. I'm not sure if my crew would agree, but you know, that's my yeah. thought. Technical yeah. issues. We have no idea what technical issues are like. We right. right. <laughs> you should try it live sometime. It's even better. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, it's it's awesome to take those kinds of uh, challenges in stride. Um, next is Jessica's, and there was someone else who who also asked uh, the same question. Kind of enough people want to know, like, how did how did it all get started? Um, you know, what was the process in, right before the beginning, really? So we learned about this story, and I have a bunch of marketers in a meeting, and we kind of talk through things we hear in the field, stuff our partners are doing, our customers. And we're like, oh, this would be good for the blog. This could be a good multimedia story, maybe a video. And then, so I shared this with the team. I'm like, I think this, or JC actually brought it to my attention and said like, this could be a really great On the Merits. And it was very different than what we did for our first On the Merits film. That was very much embedded for getting justice on behalf of the people of Flint for what happened when the water was poisoned with lead. So I was like, oh, I don't know if it has that like social justice angle. So we had to do some discussion and it was a little bit of back and forth. Like, do we see this as a good fit with a series? Is this a good fit for something else? And then I think as we talked to a bunch of different Relativians, Antiab and Dr. Murray in the film subject, we're like, this is an especially way as we learned about the inequity in healthcare and kind of bridging that gap. This is totally a story for the greater good. This is about a huge data problem. So once we knew like, okay, this is an on the merit story, we could give the time and production value that it deserves. So our team could really focus on the narrative, focus on getting the key players, coordinating Zoom interviews. We're a small but mighty team. <laughs> so that's kind of hard with a lot of competing priorities. But I think really focusing on the story was imperative. And from there, we uh, did some Zoom interviews in Chicago, or some in-person interviews in Chicago, and then brought it together. And I think shared with you all when it was near a final cut, and we're like, does this message ring true to you? We don't want to put something out. We're not the New York Times. We're not going to publish something live and be like, hey, Dr. Murray and Tayeb, you're on. You're on. <laughs> we want to make sure that this is something that all our parties are happy and excited about. So that was a big part of this as well, making sure it's in alignment between everybody that was featured. Relativians, huh? Relativity and sorry, just rolled off the tongue, but that's, that's what we call ourselves. Such an easy thing to remember. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. All right. So Tanisha wanted to ask, um, what is one of the impacts that you have seen after the film has aired? What I have seen is like my something funny. I heard my mom watched it and she isn't embedded in the tech space at all. She's like, I never knew data science was a thing. Like I have a very good understanding of it. I'm like, oh, go. Karen. Her name is Karen. I don't know. If she's talking like that, Karen. It's hard for Karens in this world today. So I thought that was very interesting and something we were very cognizant of when we were making the film. And like I mentioned earlier, Alex Wilcox and our engineer, we didn't feature him in the film because he was talking about JSON files and the difficulty of importing that. And we thought that was a core story for a while. But then we took a step back and we we're like. We want this to appeal to different audiences and talking about the structure of a JSON file, which I still can't wrap my head around, might not work. So I think that was a big impact was making sure that this made sense to everybody because this is a very big project and it has a very large impact that I think those in the medical community and tech community can readily understand the use of AI, but the lay person might not know. So I think that was really remarkable. And something too, just hearing from our colleagues that you know, we've heard this, that seeing how our technology is used to like enact good is just really cool. We're in the litigation space. That's where our technology is primarily used. And sometimes it's for good, sometimes it's not. So to really see like a powerful and real world case of how our technology was used and hearing that that inspires our colleagues was just like an unexpected huge win. 
What about you, Tayeb, from your perspective, um, both from the project and then obviously from the film of the project, what have you seen? Yeah, so from, from the project, um, I, I do want to just, you know, start by saying, you know, at the end of the day, what we did was, was cool and all, but you really need to give credit to the Allen AI team for creating that underlying data set for everyone to work off of. I feel like, you know, a lot of times all of the things you create based on that underlying data set gets all of the attention. Um, and creating that, um, like doing the manual work isn't sexy. It isn't cool in front of everyone. Um, and we get to make the cool tools off of it. So I just want to give them a little extra props um, in case it wasn't said before. Um, in terms of impacts I've seen, I know at least a good dozen or so literature reviews were written using some of the tools that were developed. Um, there's at least half a dozen companies that were started who are now working in this exact space of being able to summarize, summarize literature in real time. Um, at least four or five journals that I know of are starting to implement tools like this internally. Um, and I think it also just made another push for open science. Like it really did say, hey, we shouldn't just be doing this when we're in a global crisis in the middle of a pandemic. Let's utilize other communities. Let's create open data sets throughout the year for all different types of diseases. So I'd say all of those different things were immediate impacts that I saw happening. Um, based on the film, I think hopefully more and more uh, people in the research and medical field are like, you know, I can, I can get a little bit of limelight. I can get in front of a camera, explain my research in layman's terms, because I think that's really important. It's, it's one thing to hear that someone's doing heart disease research. It's another to understand why they're doing it and how they're doing it and how that really impacts the life of either a loved one or someone you know. Yeah. Um, this one is for from Miriam. Um, what effect has the pandemic had on the future of the medical field? Um, Dr. Moore, you can uh, feel free to answer afterwards as well. Um, so yeah, please go ahead. I'll, I'll follow up. Yeah, <laughs> me, me and Dr. Mori have, have this conversation a lot. Um, <laughs> you know, I think the pandemic exposed a lot of flaws in the medical system. It exposed a lot of our weaknesses of how we deliver healthcare in this country in general. It really showed how marginalized some communities are and how we've been putting band-aids um, towards a lot of these marginalized communities. Um, I know a lot of physicians don't necessarily think that social determinants of health are play as big of a role as they really do. Um, I think once you started looking at a lot of risk factors and why people were falling through the cracks, you could really link it back to a lot of those. Um, I hope the pandemic is going to lead to change for many of these. I think there's renewed calls for looking at why a lot of these health inequities exist. Um, Jose's brought it up many times about, you know, a lot of the biases that exist in medicine. I don't think AI purely is going to be the solution. Um, once again, we train AI algorithms based on how we currently practice. And if that's biased, then you're just leading that for future generations. So it's there, there, there's a whole host of ways I think it's changed everything from the telemedicine revolution to uh, integrating AI technologies within, within practice. I think there's, correct me if I'm wrong, 200, 250 FDA approved AI algorithms now, Jose? A lot. I haven't seen the last count, but yeah, there's a lot. Um, and I and I would I would echo pretty much everything Tay have said. I think the the two major things that I see is uh, the technological technological innovation that has really sped up by the pandemic. There's there's a joke. Uh, there's like a slide or a meme that you can see is who caused the digitization of your healthcare network? And it has, you know, like CFO, CIO, whatever, CMO. But it's really COVID-19 is the correct answer. That's really what's revolutionized the way that we kind of deliver healthcare. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, there's always startups out there. They're always pushing the boundaries of medicine. So there's always been startups that have been trying to do telemedicine and, and have kind of AI uh, synthesize early data and kind of help uh, expedite the diagnostic process. Uh, but it's when you start seeing the, the big players, the Blue Cross, Blue Shields, the, the brick and mortar facilities that weren't doing this, now doing this, 
think that's when you truly see that this has been kind of a revolutionary change that you will see uh, perpetuating into the future. And the same thing with the demographics of the people that are using it. Again, younger generations are more open always to using newer types of technologies. When you start seeing like folks like my parents, uh, you know, who are the boomers, you know, 70 plus generation, when they start embracing this new type of healthcare delivery, I think that's when you have seen a true revolution. But the other major component uh, from a, a technological perspective, outside of the US, you've had more inclusion of robotics being utilized in healthcare delivery than you've ever seen before, um, which has been really interesting. From our personal healthcare, you've seen what Tayeb said, you've seen how sick our healthcare system is. Uh, and you see that when you get stressed by any, and you see that in, real, in the real world, whenever you have like a stressor, right? It, whether it's a personal stressor, whether it's a, a business stressor, it augments the underlying foundational problems. And what this has shown us, and it hasn't just been this, we've seen it with climate change as well. You've seen it with other big stressors. The people that get affected most are the people that have been always been dis disaffected mm -hmm. most. And it just highlights why that there are underlying sicknesses to our healthcare system and the way we deliver healthcare. It's been it's been inequities upon inequities and it's just it's heartbreaking. And I have, you know, heartbreaking is one word and then it's angering in another perspective. And I think this, you know, people are saying, well well, why did this happen? Why did this happen? This happens because you have decades upon decades of people that have just been perpetuating systemically problems for certain subgroups. And, and then when the worst, when the crap hits the fan, they're the ones that get affected by it. It will always be this way unless everyone plays a role in trying to change that. That's what needs to happen. And, and I hope that does happen. I love technology. Everybody knows, you know, big technophile. But at the end of the day, what we need to stress always is that it, our humanity is what brings us most together, and hopefully technology can help bridge that gap in some capacity. But we have to remember that we're doing this for people. We're not doing this for ones and zeros. So that's uh, some of the pros and cons of, of what the pandemic has done. All right, so question from Denise, um, more on the filming aspect of it. What was kind of the most difficult part of filming? You know, especially in comparison mm -hmm. to uh, like the last film you did for, for On the Merits and kind of maybe a little comparison of those two and like the, the process mm -hmm. would be pretty cool. Lack of control would be a way to sum it up. Mm -hmm. um, so when we did Flint in person, we knew who we were going to film. We knew where we were going to film. We did our research. We knew what equipment we were going to bring. So, and we did it in a mostly inside. One interview was outside, but it was inside in an office. So you don't have that outside noise. So even for the films that we did outside with our colleagues, we would go to a park in Chicago. And there's so many, there's wind, which before I be worked with the team. I didn't know how much I hated wind, but you're you're trying to get these interviews and there's wind coming in and you can't really hear. And then when you're at a public space, there's people there. So then you're trying to navigate like getting far enough away from people. There was one point when um, Nicholas had to go up to a group of parents with small babies and ask them to move because they decided to engage in their like weekly meetup right where we were trying to film. So it's kind of just like, again, going with the flow and then really continuing to learn how to navigate this remote setting and how to film. So how do you form connections with people in this manner? How do you kind of get them to know what you're trying to do? How do you articulate that? And then how do you maximize what you are able to control? So whether that's sending equipment, whether it's just like leaning into their environment and then, you know, really focusing, I think this taught us as well to focus on the narrative and the content. Obviously you want the film's quality to be excellent because it's indicative of the work we can do and the work that we have previously produced. But for this one, I think the story was so strong. So really focusing on, are we getting the best narrative out there? Are we really being true to what our subjects are saying? And then are we forming that in a cohesive way? So I think really focusing on the talk track in addition to everything else and all the other conducive to this because of the complexity of these issues. I think Taya, when you were talking about different hospitals having different protocols in place, 
and like what that could mean. That really, the animation that she created to show how all that information can lead to like disarray really made it click for me, as well as when we you talk about Dr. Murray about healthcare research being biased because it's comprised of largely white males. So she showed like circles indicating white males. And when you try and apply that to people that don't identify as that group, like a person of color who's a female, she used a different shape to show that those don't line up and the solution is not gonna work. So I think being creative and relying on different team members was really huge and something to think more holistically about whether we're filming in person or a hybrid approach moving forward. Thank you. Tayeb, can you give us, uh, to bring this in for people and for everybody, we uh, we put a link uh, into the YouTube live so that everyone can go see the movie. I apologize for again for our technical difficulties, but can you give us a, a glimpse and give a description of really a scope of how big this project was from, from an AI perspective, the people and everyone involved. Can you give a little bit of background on that? Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if you can share my screen. I think this slide we presented at a conference yeah. took me an amazing amount of time to actually make. Um, but, you know, there were over 200, 300, 400 clinicians, scientists working on this project at one time. Um, and, you know, you can look here. I think there's at least 50, 60 different institutes uh, represented. We had folks in at least half a dozen countries. Um, it was it was, it was was a lot of fun. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just give extra props to Jan who never complained about the fact that he always ended up having to do conference calls in the middle of the night, um, he was leading our air checking team out of uh, Germany. He's a Kagler and a medical student. Um, and really, you know, on the bottom, you see that the White House OSTP really was able to leverage a lot of various um, tech partners, whether it's Microsoft, AWS, Facebook, um, IBM, everyone found a way that they could contribute resources, whether it's as data scientists on Kaggle or providing computational power or just providing any sort of support that they could. Um, it, was, it was it was a lot of fun, but a lot, a lot of different people. And some of these people just participated in the utility studies we did afterwards to see whether or not tools like this are actually useful. Um, and while that study has been written up, eventually I will submit it and it will get published. <laughs> it's one thing writing and doing the study, it's another uh, getting it through uh, peer review and actually getting it submitted. Yeah, no, another issue, another issue discussed. Mm -hmm. Fritz, we have a question from Joe. All right, so Joe asks, how did you get so many people involved? Um, Cause that, that, is a, that is a lot of people to, to coordinate and to work with. I think everyone wanted to find a way to get involved. Um, if you were, you know, I, I said in the documentary, you know, if you are a research scientist, you weren't able to go into your lab because they were trying to conserve PPE for the hospitals. And you're like, I have this basic understanding of how research works and how I can leverage that to help in the pandemic. You're like, okay, let me go out and, and find a way. Um, the National Sciences Volunteer Database was great. Um, really having a nice leadership team around me just helped me coordinate because at the end of the day, I was just, I was just trying to help push everyone in the same direction and make sure everyone's running in the same direction. Um, all these students, physicians, scientists, they did the hard work. All the data scientists on Kaggle really put in all the hours. I was just trying to make sure everyone's running in the same direction. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, that's got to be a bit of a challenge, but I think when it comes to something like this where everybody has a, a similar motivation, I'm sure it helps. Do Dr. Moria uh, actually spent a good amount of time just uh, <laughs> going through papers that I sent him of, you know, hey, is this relevant? Will this work for clinical practice? Do you think this diagnostic tool is, is a good one? And, you know, I could, you see the timestamps on Google Docs, so I could see that, you know, late at night, he's going through paper after paper after paper double checking some of these these medical students and making sure that the work we're putting out is actually clinically relevant. So thanks, Dr. Mori. I, I definitely called in a lot of favors with him throughout this whole project. No, man, it, it takes, a, it's like I mentioned, I mean, it's true. It takes a village to do anything worthwhile. Is that old, we're talking about sayings. I get that from my dad. So uh, <laughs> there's an African saying that if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And 
anything worth doing is going to be bigger than one person. Um, so happy, happy to play my small part. And uh, that's whenever you try to do something bigger yourself, you know, you take whatever role you can to do it. If you got to clean up, clean the toilets, you clean the toilets, you take out the trash, take out the trash. I and mean, there's, there's nothing above or below anyone. So you do, you do what you have to do. Um, question to Mary, we're coming up to the hour and thank you guys both for being a part of this. Oh, we got a question for Christian first and then I'll ask, I'll ask my question. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I thought this one was really cool. So I, I wanted, I wanted oh, to pull it up. Um, cool. So uh, with raising awareness to marginalized impact the virus had, like how, how likely do you guys think that we will see a change and how long do you think it will be? Cause I know that like, it can be, uh, something as, as large and traumatic as a pandemic can kind of catalyze these sorts of things. But just because everyone is noticing it doesn't necessarily mean that all of this change will will happen and, and that we'll see long term. So I uh, kind of want to hear how you guys think about it. Uh, I, I would say, you know, there's no hiding it anymore. It's right out there in the open. It's something that people are talking about on a daily basis. Um, lots of different policies have been proposed within legislation for finding ways around this. Every medical society, every research society, it is on everyone's radar that these inequities exist. They are a problem. We need to find solutions to them. Um, I also believe a lot of these communities have now been empowered um, because they have something to point to. And so they, I don't think, are going to let something like this happen again. Um, I've been saying a lot recently, you know, you know, humanity has all the resources it needs to solve all these complex problems. It's really just about the right mix of technology and cooperation um, and cooperation really being the big one there and technology enabling it. Mm -hmm. Mary, do you have thoughts on that? I think I'm very involved in inclusion diversity efforts at Relativity. It's just something I'm passionate about. And a question we always have is, how do we get more allies that, you know, specifically, it seems like the onus is always on the marginalized communities to advocate for themselves and kind of educate the masses. So I don't have a great answer, but I do know that we need to appeal to the masses. This is something that impacts all of us. We should all care about each other as human beings. So I think until we get that large scale participation from everybody, not just those it impacts, I don't know how far we'll be able to drive the needle. I, I will. An optimistic answer. <laughs> you know, Mary, actually, I'll, I'll add a little bit to the end of that. Just that the pandemic also showed that you're only as strong as the weakest member in your community. Yeah. Because the virus mm -hmm. doesn't care whether or not you are the richest member in your community or the poorest. You are only as strong as that lowest person. So, you know, folks are like, okay, well, we need to make sure vaccines are readily available to everyone. A lot of times it doesn't target those marginalized populations who aren't counted. Well, guess what? The virus can mutate in those marginalized populations, and then you're also afflicted. So it really shows you how interconnected we have all become. And even as I'd say a human race, we are only as strong as as our lowest or our weakest, most vulnerable person. Yeah, that's a great point. I think silence is complicity now. I think people have have come to realize that. And and Mary, you hit it on the head that. You know, just because, you know, you may be a man doesn't mean that you shouldn't be taking up the the fight against misogyny. I mean, I think the onus is even more so on you to do that. Same thing if you are cisgender, uh, you know, you have to be taking up the fight for your LGBTQ plus uh, colleagues. I mean, this is, it's it's no longer, you can no longer not play a role in this. You, it, the onus is on the people who are not in the marginalized communities to be part of the solution. And if you are not, then you are part of the problem. Um, and from a from a technical perspective, but a multifaceted problem takes a multifaceted approach to, to mm -hmm. solve it. And I've always been a strong proponent that especially with emerging technologies, AI is not just one, and um, AI is one of them, but with emerging technologies, we have to be careful that we don't perpetuate systemic inequalities of the past. And I'm a strong proponent uh, from a data perspective that we need to have stronger uh, data privacy and da data ownership laws, similar to uh, how the Europeans have a GDPR. I think we have actually have to go beyond that to have people know where their data is being used and how. But then we also have, I, I'm a strong proponent of having a regulatory body similar to the FDA uh, for all emerging technologies that evaluate them to make sure that they are not gonna perpetuate a systemic inequality and to reevaluate them every three to five years 
to make sure that new inequalities haven't been uh, created. Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes te technological companies, they're phenomenal and the US is particularly very good at this and really asking if something can be done and we make magic with technology. That's the beauty of science, right? We Can we do that? Can we do teleportation? Can we do time travel? Oh yeah, let's try it, we can do it. That's amazing, but the thing that they're really bad at is asking, should something be done? And that's the thing that we need to be having someone to ch just put checks and balance on our innovation and our dreaming because just because you can do something doesn't mean you should be doing it all the time, especially if it's gonna perpetuate an inequality into the future. So that's what I have to say for that. And we'll finish up with one more question where, where, where um, I love, I told you the audience is always gonna uh, really dig in. Uh, and this is great. And this is something that they really love. We're going to put the, the links already on there for the movie. We'll put another link on there so that make sure everybody gets it. But uh, last question to you, Mary, is where do you go from here? What, where does the pandemic go from here, the movie? Um, and then what is next on, on the merits kind of uh, timelines? Love the question. Thanks, Samantha. Um, so Tayeb and Dr. Murray are actually going to be on a panel that Relativity is hosting. So I'll shoot you all the link um, through Dr. Murray. I think it's April 22nd. Don't quote, don't quote me on that, but it's this month. And it's talking specifically on the angle that I'm most compelled by, which is what does healthcare look like with AI? How can we eliminate that bias? But what do you need to do in the short term to make sure it doesn't make those that much worse. So we're going to be hitting on that. And that will also be including one of our colleagues, Trish, who was involved in the project, but also thinking through how do we continue to engage with one another? Like, yes, we did the film and it was great, but there's a larger story here. So whether it's just sharing different articles or seeing how we can continue collaborating together, I think this is the great start of a conversation. We don't want it to be, okay, we did the film, let's run on to some the next great thing. We want to just brainstorm ways, whether it's content, whether it's conversations to continue this conversation, because like you talked about earlier, this happens time and time again to marginalized communities. It happens with what happened in Flint, it happened what happened here. So wanna make sure we're continuing the dialogue. And then our next film, we are in the exploratory phases. We're really excited on some, some bites we have. So we'll keep y'all posted and Dr. Murray and Tayab, I'll be sure to keep you guys posted as well so you can share the link with our next film we'll see we'll see what that looks like filming wise we'll see what the world looks like when it comes comes time for that awesome well thank you very much Taya. thank you very much mary um for everything this has been very inspirational thank you for sharing your your hour with us and we look forward to carrying on the conversation offline with you thank you so much it was a pleasure looking forward to it good night everyone good night, good night. Bye.